Today, we're going to have a look at Fibonacci heaps. So if you know Dijkstra's algorithm, you've probably seen Fibonacci heaps as a solution to speed up Dijkstra's algorithm, but you probably actually didn't see the Fibonacci heaps, but only have seen them mentioned. We are going to have a close look at them today and also analyze them. So in general, what is this about? It's about an efficient solution for a mergeable heap with also an efficient decrease key operation. So mergeable heaps means I want to be able, given two heaps, to efficiently make them into one heap. And for that, a solution are binomial heaps. So there's a video about that also. And I assume here that you've seen that video. If you haven't, I think you can follow along, but it might be a bit quick. Definitely what you should know is amortized analysis with a potential method. So in doubt, have a look at that first, then come back here. So what's a Fibonacci heap? So generally speaking, it's simply a set of trees with the min heap property. So as in the example here, I have four trees, two of them are just one node, and each of them has a min heap property, so parent is smaller or equal than its children. They are not in any way complete binary uh, heaps. They are also not binomial uh, uh, trees, those trees, but uh, simply trees with a min heap property. We will store the following information for every node. So we're storing the parent, um, the leftmost child, the left sibling and the right sibling, and the key, obviously. Then we have the degree. So the degree will be used to decide for trees which trees to merge. So this is very similar to the binomial trees. So there we were also merging trees with the same degree, but there we had the property that these were then actually the same trees. This is not the case anymore. We're just merging based on the degree. And then there's also the mark, but the mark I'm going to talk about later. Generally, this is essentially like binomial heaps, just that for binomial heaps to maintain the structure, we had some overhead, which in particular in the decrease key, which we are now going to get rid of. Then we have a bit less structure, a bit more work in the analysis, but everything goes through at the end. In particular, the idea is essentially, we start off with something similar to binomial heaps, but we want to have a lazy decrease key, as you will see. Okay, now about the set. We will use for the analysis potential method with the following potential number of trees in my set plus two times the number of marks. So any node can be marked or not marked. What these marks are, I will say later when I talk about the decrease key. So for now, when we do the analysis, just ignore the marks. So initially the marks are zero, so there are no marks. We can ignore that until we get to the decrease key and then that will also make sense. In particular, initially nothing is marked, so the initial potential is zero. And also because both of these are positive numbers, the potential always stays non-negative. So the potential method applies and we can compute amortized cost as actual cost plus change in potential. So we will need to have this uh, potential function. And a key to the analysis is also bounding the maximum degree. So for binomial heaps, that was something that was very easy to say that the maximum degree is bounded by log n. Here, we will have to put work into that. And we will do the analysis assuming a maximum degree of dn. And at the end, we're going to show that d of n is in O of log n. So those are the two ingredients, the potential function, and we're going to compute amortized cost with those. And then at the end, see that the d of n, which eventually shows up in the runtime, is actually just O of log n. Let's go through some operations. And we want to compute the amortized cost. So amortized cost always actual cost plus change in potential. Generating an empty heap that we can do in constant time. We just make a list. We don't create trees. Max we are also zero. That means the actual cost is O of one. No change in potential. Amortized cost is O of one. Min, we simply return the key of the minimum root. We have a pointer to that. We can do that in constant time, no change in potential. Union, 
In the union, we simply concatenate the list of trees. So this is like the lazy union for binomial heaps. So we have two Fibonacci heaps, which are sets of trees. We simply, and, and we store them in a list, we concatenate those lists. That is a constant time operation. We have to update the min root. So we have two, each of the lists came with a min. We take the min of those two. Also, that is constant time. The number of trees does not change. Number of marks does not change. So overall, this is again constant time. Insert. So insert, we have to make a heap of this one node. And we add it to our list of trees. Um, then we have to potentially update the min root if the new one is smaller than the previous min. So again, this is constant amount of work. We get one additional tree. So the change of in potential is one. So still, this is O of one. Now, just to see where, whether this makes sense so far, if I simply do n, n inserts, so starting with an empty heap, I do n insert operations. How does my Fibonacci heap look out, uh, like after that? So each insert simply concatenates a new node. So at this point, we simply have a list of single nodes. So nothing fancy, but that was also the same when we did binomial heaps with lazy union. Now, the next operation that we're going to look at is delete min. So the delete min is exactly like the delete min for binomial heaps with lazy union. Uh, so what did we do there? So first of all, we delete the min root. So let me have just some quick example here. Let's say that this is my current Fibonacci heap. And I have a pointer to the one here. The one I would now delete. I delete that, then I create this array where I have one entry for every possible degree. So this array goes from zero, from zero to D of N. And then all of my trees, I simply put into that array according to their degree. I mean, the degree I've stored, so I can easily do that. And every time I, there's already an tree there, I link them. And linking means, so if I have two trees, I have two trees, linking means here I take the one where the root the, has a smaller key and connect, make that on the root and connect the other root as the child to that one. So in my example, the node two here, that would go into zero because it has degree zero. The six would also go there, but I would link them. So then here now I would have a tree with two and six. And then the nine and its two children, they have degree two. That one would go, go, go here, nine. And then I have one of degree one, the three. This one would go here with the two and six, three and five. But I would link them. So then I would get the tree, let me draw it here, two six and then below three five i would now want to put that into where the degree two is there is already a tree there so then i again link and in that way get at most one tree for any degree and then when i have the set of trees i then again make them into a list and i'm done so this is the delete min operation and the actual cost uh, can be bounded by O of essentially the number of trees that I have overall, which is the trees that I had before. So this is a T plus the trees that I get by removing the min and the children of the min are now trees. Um, and that is uh, bounded by D of N. No, because I, d of n is maximum degree, so this minimum had at most d of n children. So this is the number of trees I'm going to deal with. So I create the array of size d of n that, of course, also just takes off d of n time. I throw those in. So all of the process can be uh, done in this time. So how does the potential change? 
So the potential changes in the following way. So the potential after putting everything into the array and then appropriately linking is bounded by, so we have the number of trees to look at, uh, but assuming that we have this upper bound on the number of tree on the number of degrees, I, for every degree I only have one tree, and the degrees are between zero and d of n. So after all of this, the number of trees is bounded by d of n plus one. I didn't touch the marks yet, so that is simply what it was before, and the potential before was simply whatever tree, number of trees I had before plus the number two times the number of marks that I had. Now, this essentially means I have d of n minus t of h plus 1. And if I now want to calculate the amortized cost, I take actual cost plus change in potential. So O of d of n plus t of h plus this number here. Now comes a small technicality, and that is the following. I have this t of h here, the number of trees before, and I have it negatively here. What I would like to do would be to say number of trees minus number of trees, that's zero. Problem is the first t of h is in this O. So there's some constant in front of it, which I can't simply ignore. What I will do is I will assume that the potential, the constant factor in the potential is large enough so that it's so large that it can, the minus t of h is at least as big as the O of t of h. You will see that called assuming we sufficiently scale up the potential. What that actually means is that this potential, you can think of it as there is a constant outside of it. All of the analysis uh, stays the same with such a constant but if I make this constant large enough, it can eat up the t of h which within the O. And if we can do that, then these two are cancelled out. I only have O of d of n left. And that is what I wanted to show you. So far, we didn't touch the marks yet. So that's something that will happen soon. But before that, a quick question. So here's a question. If I do n inserts and then one delete min, how does my Fibonacci heap look like, or more specifically, is it then actually a binomial heap? The answer to this is yes. So let's look at this by example. If I do n inserts and I simply get such a list, at that point, each of these trees is actually a binomial tree of size 1 or degree 0. And then the delete min does exactly the same as for the binomial heaps. So then I would actually get this nice binomial tree as a result. If I now, for instance, continue, I union this with this tree, I insert a 2, delete min. How does my heap look like after that? The delete min simply deletes the two that I inserted and the two didn't have children. So I'm simply merging, or taking actually the union of those two trees by putting them into the array and linking. So then the result would look like this. Now we come to the decrease key operation, which I here abbreviate as dec key. How does decrease key work? Essentially, we want to do it as lazy as Possible. And what we do is, so in this example, uh, we want to decrease the key of this node x. So it has currently a key of 8. We want to decrease it to 2. So in our binomial heap, we would now have bubbled this up, but that would have cost us log n. So what we do instead, if we decrease the key, and uh, this would violate the binomial heap property, we simply cut it out. So this one disappears. Obviously, we still need the two, so we make the two a separate node. Yeah, that's the simplest way, possible way of uh, solving our decrease key problem. Now we have to be careful that we do not mess too much with the structure of the tree. 
And what we do, therefore, is we mark its parent. So this now looks like this. This is after decreasing the key of x. Now, we want to be careful that for a given node, we do not delete too many of its children, because what we essentially want to have is we want to have a relation between the degrees of a node and the size of the subtree. And this might get destroyed if I'm deleting too many children. So I, essentially, for any node, I'm only allowed to delete one child. And how this is done is, when I'm deleting the first child, I simply mark a node. If I now delete another child, so let's say now I want to delete the 9 here. I mean, I don't want to delete it. I want to decrease the key. I do that again by cutting it away. So this will be in my new list somewhere. I will have the 1 here because that's a new key and the 10. But now the 6 had had two children removed or differently stated, it was marked before we did the cut. So if that is the case, so if the parent was already marked, unless it's a root already, then we also cut the subtree at the parent. So we also take the 6 out in this case. And also we do this recursively upwards. So if the 3 was already marked, okay, the 3 is a root, so nothing would happen because roots we never cut out because they are already roots. But if it had a non-root parent that was already marked, we would have also cut that and so on. This is the result. So this one ends up here. The 6 gets it separately. And that's all. Let me, just to be precise, also show this as pseudo-code. So here's a decrease key. Looking at this node x, we want to decrease the key of x. We're looking at the parent of x, we call that y. If y is not nil, meaning x wasn't already a root. And the key of x, so the new key of x is smaller than the key of y. So the min heap property is violated. Then we cut. So and cutting means we make, we take the subtree rooted at x, make it a new tree in our list. And we recurse upwards. So this is called cascade cut. So cascade cut, we would call cascade cut on y. And essentially what that does, it looks at the parent of y. If that, so z here in this case, if that is not nil, so if, if y is not already a root, we mark y. If it wasn't marked already, so if it wasn't marked, we mark it. If it already was marked, we recur. So we cut y and cascade up. And then we also need to update the minimum if the decrease key operation sets a node or the key to a key that was smaller than the previous minimum. So that is the decrease key and with the cuts and with the marks. So now we also know what the marks actually do. So now let's analyze the amortized cost of the decrease key operation. So for that, we have to look at actual cost plus change of potential. So the actual cost is O of, and then essentially the number of cuts I make. So I have, of course, min, at least constant. So I have O of one plus number of cuts. I distinguish between the first cut and the cascading cut. So if I cut, I mean, this this one first cut, and then I recurse upwards. Those are the cascading cuts. So I have, I have k cuts. I have k minus one cascading cuts. So the amortized cost is O of one plus k. Now what is a change of potential? So let's look at the potential before. Or let's look at the potential after minus the potential before. So the potential after is so I have the trees that I had previously, and I have one extra tree for every cut. Yeah, so here I have a plus k for each of the cuts. But now, for the first time, also the number of marks changes. So it changes in the following way. I potentially mark the parent. So this gives me a potential plus one. It doesn't have to happen if it was a root. Therefore, it also has a smaller equal here. 
So I have a plus one there. But then if I cascade, while cascading upwards, every time I cut out a node and make it a root, I actually unmark it. Therefore, with k minus 1 cascading cuts, I also unmark k minus 1 nodes. So I get as change in terms of number of marks, this minus k minus 1 plus 1, at least at most, so this is minus k plus 2. And this is the old potential, and if I calculate this, it says I have a 2 here, times 2, this gives me 4, and then I have a k here, I have 2 times minus k, so I have minus k here. So this is my change in potential. Now the amortized cost is the sum of actual cost change in potential. This gives me essentially O of 1 plus k, or because I have the 4 anyway, I can write it as O of k, plus 4 minus k. And now we do the same trick as before by appropriately scaling the potential function to make sure that this minus k coins are large enough to swallow this O of k, this adds up to O of 1. The question, so why is there the 2 here in the potential? Why isn't it simply number of trees plus number of marks? The reason is the following. So in the decrease key, we might be doing many cuts, and that is a kind of non-constant part that we need to bound in our amortized analysis. And for every cut, I generate a new tree, and I generate cost in performing the algorithm. And I have to cover that. Luckily, with each cut, I also remove a mark, at least except for the first one. So I can pay with the marks, but I will have to pay two. And scaling up the potential doesn't, wouldn't do the job here because if I scale up the number of marks uh, and scale up the number of trees at the same time, that doesn't help. But if I scale up simply the number of marks, which we did, two times the number of marks, that works. Let's summarize what we have. So we've analyzed the amortized running time of all of the operations. In particular, decrease key is in O of 1 amortized time. So let's look at this overview, we have amortized running times of O of 1 for all operations except for the delete min, where we had this O of D of N, and D of N was a bound on the maximum degree. So what remains is actually bounding D of N. So, and will that work? Yes, of course, <laughs> otherwise we would be in trouble. And let me give you some intuition first, and then we do the formal analysis. So if we would never actually cut then in the whole process, we would only be dealing with binomial heaps. So let's have a look at that case. In the case of binomial heaps, we came to the bound on the maximum degree in the following way. We knew for a node, if it has degree k, then the size of the subtree rooted at x, so here written as size of x, is actually exactly 2 to the k. So is it degree of k, the subtree has uh, an exponential size. And this immediately then implies that for a binomial heap, the maximum degree is bounded by order log n. The same analysis does not work if we have the cuts. So if we cut, at least what we know, we only cut at most one child per node. What this means for us is that the degree of any node changes by at most one. And now, essentially, we will again want to do an inductive argument, which gets a bit more complicated. But what we will be able to show is that the size of x is, okay, it's not 2 to the k anymore, but it's at least golden ratio, or 1.6 something, to the k. Before we do so, let's have another question. 
Can we bound d of n if we allow to cut more than one child? Yeah, if I can cut as many children as I want. So that is not the case. So an easy example, let's just take an actual binomial heap and of sufficiently large degree and then cut off below the level one. Then I have a node with very high degree. And if I now start linking those, then I get even higher degree and so on. And I also no longer get a guarantee between size and degree. Okay, so now for the formal side, what we want to show is that d of n is bounded by the logarithm of n to the base golden ratio. Golden ratio is 1 plus square root of 5 divided by 2. We will do so in several steps, so with several lemmas. What we're going to show is that the size of x, so of a node, of degree k, uh, so the size of the subtree, is larger equal the k plus first Fibonacci number. So Fibonacci numbers, so we have, you have this f0 is 0, f1 is 1, f2 is f1 plus f0, f3 is f2 plus f1, and so on. So you get this sequence. Those are the Fibonacci numbers. So the size is at least the k plus second Fibonacci number, and then something that has nothing to do with algorithms, but we will prove it again anyway, is that the k plus first Fibonacci number is actually at least as large as a golden ratio to the k. And that then implies that uh, n, so n is definitely an upper bound on the size of any subtree, which is the upper bounds phi of maximum degree. Thus, if I take logarithms, the maximum degree is bounded by the logarithm of n base, um, the golden ratio. Let's prove our first lemma. This is already an important lemma, but a very simple one, as you will see when we look at the proof. So I'm looking at an average node x of degree k in a Fibonacci heap. Uh, the children are yi to yk. I mean, it has degree k, so k children. And they are ordered by h. What I mean is that the, uh, ta at the time when y i was added as a child to x, so it was linked to the v of x, then y i minus 1 to y 1, they were already there. And what we can conclude then is, first of all, the degree of y 1 is at least 0, so that's a trivial statement. But the interesting part is that the degree of y i, or i larger than 1, is at least i minus 2. And so this follows fairly immediately. Again, that y1 has degree at least 0 is true because any node has a degree, degree at least 0. And now for the second part, we look at the point in time where y i was linked to x. At that point, x had at least i minus 1 children, namely y1 to y i minus 1. So the degree of x was at that point at least i minus 1, possibly i, but at least i minus 1. Therefore, the degree of yi, which was equal to the degree of x, because otherwise I wouldn't have, wouldn't have linked them, is, uh, was at least i minus 1 at that point. I can delete at most one child for any node, so the degree of yi then has to be at least i minus 1 minus 1, so i minus 2. That is our first lemma. Lemma number 2 has nothing to do with algorithms. It's just about Fibonacci numbers. It's a very simple induction. Maybe you want to try it uh, yourself, or just quickly see how it works. So the k plus a second Fibonacci number is at least 1 plus the sum of Fibonacci numbers up to k. We start with the base case of k is 0. If k is 0, I have to look at f2. f2 is 1 plus 0, uh, which is the same as 1 plus f0. And f0 is the sum from i2 going from 0 to 0. Now, for k larger 0, let's have a look at fk plus 2. 
the definition of the Fibonacci numbers is that this is fk plus fk plus 1. Now, I use induction hypothesis on fk plus 1. This gives me, okay, if k is from here, so this gives me this 1 plus the sum up to k minus 1. Now, I put the fk into the sum, then the sum goes up to k, and that's it. So, we have, are done with our second lemma. Lemma number three. Again, nothing to do with algorithms, but uh, we do it anyway, because we're going to use it. fk plus 2 is at least the golden ratio to the k. Again, a simple induction. And for that, okay, let's first do the induction, then talk about the golden ratio once more. So if k is 0, this is true because f of 2 is 1, which is i to 0. If we have k is 1, then we're looking at f3. f3 is f2 plus f1 is 2, and 2 is larger than i to the 1. I mean, this is 1.6, blah, 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 to the 1, so 1.6 something. And... For k larger, 2, we have if k plus 2, we use a definition. We plug in the induction hypothesis. Now, we take out this factor, so we get this equation here. And now, we know and use the definition of the golden ratio, um, which is that it's defined by this equation, i squared is 1 plus 5, or we have the 5 plus 1 here, which we now can replace by 5 squared, and then 5 to the k minus 2 times 5 to the 2 is simply 5 to the k. So lemma 3 is also done. So now we come to our crucial lemma, lemma 4, and that states the following. I look at x, uh, and that's a node of degree k in our Fibonacci. And the claim is that the size of x, so the size of the subtree at x is at least as large as the k plus second Fibonacci number. For the proof, we look at these sk. And what is sk? sk is the minimum size any node in any Fibonacci heap um, of degree, and uh, any node of degree k in any Fibonacci heap could have. So in particular, the size of x is at least sk, because sk is the minimal size that such a node could have. So let's first look at our two examples. What is S0 and what is S1? So S0, I ask about the minimum size of a tree where the root has degree 0. So if the root has degree 0, it doesn't have children. There's actually only one option, namely only having this one node. So S0 is 1. S1, if I have a node here, it has degree 1, so it has a child. Now, there could be more here, but I'm asking about the minimum size. The minimum size is 2. One, two. So, as, as 0 is 1, as 1 is 2, and what we can also see is a sk growth with k. Now, back to x, or back to degree k. So, let's look at a node at z a node of degree k and of size sk. So z is now an example for a minimum sized, uh, for a degree k with minimum size subtree. And we look at its children. Yeah? And now you can already see this, we'll be using lemma one, namely some bound on the number, on the degree of the children. So back to the x of our lemma, the size of x, is at least the minimum size that a, that a subtree of a node of degree k could have. So size of x is at least sk. And now sk, I mean, this comes from the z, and the z has its children y1, y2, up to, so z has degree k, so up to yk. So how many nodes does this subtree have? I count in the following way. This gives me 1, z itself. 
y1 gives me one. And of course, there will be, could be more nodes below these y, but for the y1, I only know, so lemma one only gives me, it has at least degree zero. So I know there is this node, I don't know whether there's more. But for each of the other ones, I can actually conclude that they have at least a certain degree, namely, so the degree of the y i is by lemma one at least i minus two. But if, so I have a y i here, let's say, an arbitrary one. If this one has degree at least i minus two, then it's the size of the subtree at y i is at least s i minus two. So I get as a bound, so sk is a, a, a lower bounded by 1 plus 1 plus the sum of the sizes of these trees and the sum of the sizes of those trees is this sum here, sum of s um, i minus 2. Now we use induction. Because now we have sk here and a term with smaller s i. So by induction, we now want to show that sk is at least f of k plus 2, and then the lemma immediately follows. So we have s0 is 1, s1 is 2, we stated that already above. sk, now I can use this equation here, sk is at least 2 plus this sum. Now by induction hypothesis, I can plug in for si minus 2, I know that is uh, an upper bound for, so here was k and k plus 2, so i minus 2 and i, so I get the sum 2 plus the fi. But now this sum starts with i is 2, where I would like to have it start with 0, so I have to add the f0, which is 0, so that I can add for free and the f1, which is 1, uh, that I can take one, 1 out here, so 1 goes out here, therefore I can do 0 here, that's a term that I have over here. But now I can apply my lemma 2, which states that this is exactly the fk plus 2, and I end up with, I wanted, with what I wanted to show. Yeah, and that is all we needed. So here once more all our lemmas, so we can conclude d of n is in O of log n. And with that we have everything that we wanted to have. So let's look at the running times again. So for the Fibonacci heaps, all amortized running times are O of 1. Actually the only th time where amortization actually happened there is in the decrease key, so that's amortized constant, the other operations are actually truly constant. Then we had the delete min, where we had O of D of N, where we can now say it's O of log N amortized. If you compare this to the binomial heaps, even with a lazy union, we now have a faster decrease key, and compared to the simple binary heaps, we have the faster decrease key, we have the faster insert, and we definitely have the faster union because for binary heaps, we were actually not able to do any clever union and would need to do that in linear time. And that's all.